it's amazing. Well, it's good to have everybody out for Wednesday in the Word. We're going to break into our small groups in, in just a moment. But uh, we were talking Sunday about faith boosters. And Wednesday night, when we come to church, it's a, another faith booster. We, we go through Monday and Tuesday, and we need a boost. <laughs> and then when you're able to get together in your small groups, that's when you get a chance, the Bible says, to sharpen each other. Iron sharpens iron. So is there anybody here tonight that you haven't been in one of the small groups? You're not one of the small group? You're not in a small group? Anybody? Well, as we come to the, uh, after I finish teaching, then uh, Mike Hudson's going to come down and get everybody into their groups because we want everybody to grow. We, we want everybody to receive what God has for them. And, and to do that, we have to keep growing. So praise God. We're going to do that this, this evening. We're, we're studying the book of James. Does, many of you have this book on Sunday. You started the uh, classes. And then this evening, we're going to pick it up again and talk about the book of James. That's a, that's a powerful book. But before we do, I, I just want to just follow through on something I just sensed in the spirit when, when the uh, praise team was singing and, and Leroy was ministering about on earth as it is in heaven. If I wrote this down right, uh, Leroy, you said, if it's not happening in heaven, it shouldn't be on earth. Is that kind of, that, that is so powerful. Um, that God's whole plan, the whole vision, let's start in Philippians chapter 2. Let's start there. Philippians chapter 2. In Philippians chapter 2, verse 5, it says, Let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus. We're going to get to James here in just a few minutes. Who being in the form, this is talking about Jesus, being in the form of God, thought it not robbery to be equal with God, but made himself of no reputation, took upon him the form of a what? Of a servant and was made in the likeness of men. And being found in fashion as a man, he humbled himself and became obedient unto death, even the death of the cross. Wherefore God also hath highly exalted him and given him a name which is above every name, that at the name of Jesus every knee should bow, of things in heaven and things in earth and things under the earth, and that every tongue should confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. It says that Jesus became obedient, even he was obedient even unto death. Because, and you read it in Hebrews, he said he despised the shame because of what was set before him, the joy that was set before him. And the joy, of course, we, we're, we're used to thinking of the joy as, as me, as you, as us, that God, his great joy was that he would receive us. And Jesus was obedient unto the cross so that he could receive us. But it's not just us. He wanted to receive us restored to who we were created to be. Not just he received us and, and we just kind of, hobbled in and didn't and just just fell at his feet but no he wanted to receive us back to what we were created for in the beginning and so he died for restoration now what we're going to talk about this evening in the book of James yeah wow that's something let me tell you this, what the Lord was showing me. Uh, no, no. Okay, let's go into the book of James. All righty. James chapter 1. How many folks were in the Sunday school class with James? Okay, okay, good. Okay, so y'all can jump in there. Everybody can jump in there. James chapter 1.
starting at verse, I'm going to start verse 18. I'm going to read it in the New King James. Of his own will, he brought us forth by the word of God that we might be a kind of first fruits of his creatures. So then, my beloved brethren, let every man be swift to hear, slow to speak, slow to wrath, for the wrath of man does not produce the righteousness of God. Therefore, lay aside all filthiness and overflow of wickedness, and receive with meekness the implanted word, which is able to save your souls. But be doers of the word and not hearers only, deceiving yourselves. For if anyone is a hearer of the word and not a doer, he's like a man observing his natural face in a mirror, for he observes himself, goes away, and immediately forgets what kind of man he was. But he who looks into the perfect law of liberty and continues in it and is not forgetful, a forgetful hearer, but a doer of the work, this one will be blessed in what he does. If anyone among you thinks he is religious and does not bridle his tongue, but deceives his own heart, this one's religion is useless. Pure and undefiled religion before God and the Father is this, to visit orphans and widows in their trouble and to keep oneself unspotted from the world. Now, sometimes we can get the idea that that prayer that Jesus prayed and that purpose that Jesus lived for and that song that the praise team sang that God's will would be done on earth as it is in heaven is impossible. Uh, I was thinking uh, while I was standing there worshiping about a, a conversation I was having with someone earlier this week and, and we were talking about how far America has gone away from God and how, and, and I was thinking about how it looks impossible. It's impossible. We were talking about different presidents and we were talking about different legislatures and, and all the different things that have happened. It just looks impossible that the will of God could be restored to America, that the will of God could be restored in schools and in families and in businesses and in, and, and, and in, and in entertainment. And, and while we were standing there worshiping and his kingdom come will be done on earth as it has. And then it, it started to come to me. It's as impossible as it is for a man who's been dead three days to rise again. It is as impossible for America to be revived to God. It is as impossible as it is for a man who's been dead three days to rise again. And so, boy, I was, oh, when I see it, God, okay, okay, I'm in the fight, Jesus, I'm still here. Because we get weary when we start to think wrong. Doubt will make you weary. Unbelief will make you wear out. But when you start to believe God and believe right, it causes boldness to come back. It causes strength to come back. It causes courage to come back. And so, oh, praise God. The Lord has revived me again. Hallelujah. <laughs> now here in James chapter, I'm going to start at verse 18. Because this is important that we get this. This helps to revive us. Of his own will, he brought us forth by the word of truth that we might be a kind of first fruits of his creatures. So first of all, he chose, God chose to give birth to us. He could have aborted, he could have easily aborted us because we were a mess. You talk about somebody that's messed up in the womb, we were messed up. Everything from the time that we started with Adam and walked in sin, God should have kicked all of us into hell. Started all over with a new breed, a new bunch. But of his will, he chose to bring us forth. He chose to give us 
new birth instead of what we deserved. Come on. Now, now this is important because this is the foundation upon which, from which we spring. When we get ready to jump on the devil, when we get ready to leap on something, we spring from a foundation. And that foundation is that he chose to bring us forth. He chose to birth us. He saw something that he had put in us we didn't even see in ourselves, but he chose to bring us forth. Now watch this. He chose to bring us forth by the word. So we're born by an incorruptible seed, the Bible says, 1 Peter, that we're born of the, or Peter, we're born of the incorruptible seed of the word of God, that we might be a kind of first fruits of his creatures. In other words, until man was restored to God, creation could not be restored to God. Until man was reconciled, until man was born, until the born again race rose up, there could be no restoration for the rest of the creation. But we were first fruits. Mankind, you and I, we're the first fruits. And through his people, God is going to restore families, God is going to restore nations, God is going to restore the planet. The Bible says in Romans, let's, let's, as a matter of fact, let's go over, hold your place here, let's go back to Romans chapter 8. Romans chapter 8. Starting, let's start at verse uh, 22. For we know that the whole creation groaneth and travaileth in pain together until now. Now let's back up. Let's go back up a little bit. Back up. Verse 19. The, the earnest expectation of the creature, that's the creation, waits or waiteth for the manifestation of the sons of God. You see, creation could not be set free until those who were created to rule the creation are set free. Did you understand? Creation could not be set free until those who were created to rule the creation were set free. And so the whole creation, he says, it's been waiting, waiting in expectation for the manifestations of the sons and daughters of God. It's been made subject in vanity, uh, to vanity. And then he says that the creature or the creation shall be delivered from the bondage of corruption, that's sin, into the glorious liberty of the children of God. So, okay, so back to James chapter 1. So this is the foundation now. We know we were created to subdue evil, and the whole creation fell when we fell. And when we are restored, that's the beginning of the restoration of everything else. So he chose to restore us. Okay. So now, let's go on over to verse, uh, verse 19. That's the foundation. Okay, verse 18 is the foundation. Verse 19 is where it gets, it, get, it gets interesting. So then, my beloved brother, so then, because this is who you are, because you're the ones who've been restored to restore the creation, because this is who you are, so then, my beloved brother, let every one of you be swift to what? To hear, slow to what? Speak, slow to wrath. For the wrath of man does not produce the righteousness of God. Now let me give you five, five weapons that you're going to have to deal with as long as you're on this planet. Five weapons that the enemy will always bring back against your life. And you're going to you're gonna have to learn to, to win every time it comes up. Number one, first weapon is strife. You're going to always have to deal with strife. You know how the Bible says that, that the devil left Jesus for an opportune time. He tempted Jesus, then he left Jesus for an opportune time. And he's going to leave you for an opportune time, but he's going to come back. And one of the things he's going to come back with, he's going to come back with some kind of temptation 
to strife. I, I, let me just give you all of these, and I'll come back to strife in a minute. I, another one, he's gonna all, you're going to always have to resist fear. Number two, fear. You're going to always have to resist strife. You're going to always have to resist fear. Number three, you're going to always have to resist lust. You're going to always have to resist love. As long as you're on this planet, you're going to have to resist fear, you're going to have to resist strife, and you're going to have to resist lust. Number four, you're going to always have to resist condemnation. You're going to all, as long as you are living on this planet, the devil's going to bring it back again and again and again. I know you're going to say, well, I thought I was delivered from condemnation. You were. Glory to God. He's back. Because he's always trying, he's looking for an opportune time, just like he was with Jesus. He's always looking. But the Bible says that Jesus resisted him, and you can resist him too. Number five, confusion. He's going to always come back with something to confuse you. So that your, your, your purpose is fuzzy. Your, 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 why are you doing this? It's fuzzy. Now let me go back to strife just a minute. You're going to always have a temptation to resist for strife. I was in the, uh, in the grocery store uh, a few days ago, a couple weeks now, and I bought some, some fruit. And so I was at the self-checkout with the fruit. And when I put the fruit on the, you know, the glass there, it, it didn't ring right. And so the lady caught me. And that's the way it kind of it kind of turned into a hey, put this. You're supposed to put that on the on the weight, on the on the scales. I said I put it on the scales. <laughs> and and so she's talking, and I found myself talking back. And the more I talked back, the matter I was getting. And I'm thinking, do you know who I am? I mean, I never let it come out my mouth, you know what I'm saying? But I'm thinking, I wouldn't steal this little piece of fruit. Listen. But it's starting to rise up now, and now I'm defensive. The more I talk, the more defensive I become. And she says something, I'm coming right, well, why didn't you tell, I, I, I've been doing it like this, why don't you, don't y'all have some instructions? The more I talked, the more I escalated, and the only thing that told me, the only way I knew I was wrong, was I could feel the anger. And the Lord, that scripture that we're reading says, the wrath of man does not produce the righteousness of God. You may think you're right. You can be right. But if it gets you to the place where you're angry about it, then you've stepped out of the will of God. You've stepped out of the fruit and the, the spirit of God, and you're over in the flesh. Come, come on. Are y'all okay? See, anger cannot... You may be right. They may be wrong. But if you allow yourself to, that's why it says, be swift to hear, but slow to speak. Because your words will carry you where you don't want to go. And so, so it's so important. Even, you know, I mean, you could be talking about that situation or, or something, you know, in the store. Or you could be talking about your relationship with somebody, your, your husband, your wife. You know, sometimes the Lord will say, don't say it. Don't say it. And, and I'm like, well, you know, I think it's okay. <laughs> I think it's going to be okay. And then about 10 minutes later, I'm thinking, I should never have said it. <laughs> but you can tell. You can tell when you said what you shouldn't have said because you can feel something start. And you're, you've been given a, a Holy Ghost to be a, a, a kind of a, a monitor for you so you, you can tell, you can sense that when you're going on. You, you understand? 
So you're always, no matter who you are, <laughs> or who you think you are, <laughs> you can always be tempted with strife, fear, lust, condemnation, and confusion. 